I want to uh, leave as much time as possible for questions. So I will get straight to the topic. Why should Singapore care about the Middle East? Well, the short answer is, despite our very best efforts over quite some time to ignore the Middle East, the Middle East refused to ignore us. And I don't mean that facetiously, I mean that literally. My very first job in MFA when I joined uh, the service in the early 19, in 1981 to be precise, uh, my very first job was, was to be desk officer for the Middle East. And I held that august position for all of 40 minutes before our then permanent secretary, Mr. S. R. Nathan, the late S. R. Nathan, our former president, uh, found out about it. And as it was reported to me, which I later confirmed with him, said, give the boy a proper job. And that pretty much summed up our attitude to the Middle East for a long time. Um, we had, at that time, only two diplomatic missions in the Middle East, and the reasons for setting them up had very little to do with the Middle East per se. We had a mission in Cairo, Egypt, not because we were particularly interested in Egypt or North Africa or the Middle East, but because when we were unceremoniously removed from Malaysia, we needed diplomatic recognition, and Egypt was one of the leading lights of the non-aligned movement, and we thought we better uh, have a presence there so we could, if necessary, make contact with other members of the non-aligned movement and get their diplomatic recognition. We also had, and this is the only other mission we had in the Middle East, uh, a consulate in Jeddah. And it was not because we were particularly interested in Saudi Arabia. It's only to service Singapore Muslims who went on the Hajj. In other words, for most of the year, they didn't have very much to do. Um, did, that didn't know, this doesn't mean we didn't have anything to do with the Middle East, but it was very tangential, very marginal. We, of course, interacted with Middle Eastern countries in places like the UN, the non aligned Meeting, and other international organizations. We dealt with Middle East issues in the UN. But any of you who know the UN will know that that is a very uh, artificial environment. What happens in the UN is only peripherally connected to what happens in the real world. Uh, we are, of course, an oil refining center. Uh, but the oil supplies were secured by the oil major, so we didn't really have to worry about it. And we had, the closest relationship we had in the Middle East was with Israel. I'll talk a bit more about Israel later on, but, and we had to balance our relations with the Arab countries with Israel. But by and large, this was not a deep relationship, it is not something we spent a lot of time on, and Mr. Nathan, the late Mr. Nathan was not wrong when he said, to, to my boss then, give the boy a proper job, and I did something else. Um, but this was pretty much the situation of our relationship with the Middle East until the late 1990s and the early 2000s, when we discovered, despite all these efforts to ignore the Middle East, the Middle East refused to ignore us. Around that time, late 1990s, early 2000s, we began to recognize that something was happening all around us in Singapore and all around us in Southeast Asia that was connected to the Middle East. And what we began to notice was that Islam as traditionally conceived of and practiced in Southeast Asia was being transformed by influences from the Middle East. Now, Islam, of course, comes from the Middle East originally. But the Islam that was practiced in Southeast Asia as it evolved over centuries in Southeast Asia was a very open, syncretic one, um, very Sufis, incorporating elements of Hinduism, Buddhism, and you know, uh, traditional culture, the adat of uh, the indigenous peoples of this region. But it was being transformed, almost without our noticing it, 
And by the time we started the Gnosticid, it had been substantially changed. Uh, this is a phenomenon that I and some others have called the Arabization of Islam in Southeast Asia. It really should be called the Wahhabization or the Salafization of Islam in Southeast Asia. Whereas this traditional open syncretic way of practicing Islam was being replaced by something that was more purist in focus, more narrow in focus, and more exclusive in its focus. And this was a matter of concern. Not a religious concern per se, because how anybody wants to practice any religion is their own business. But because every society in Southeast Asia, and certainly Singapore, is a plural society. There is no homogeneous society in Southeast Asia. Even Thailand and Vietnam, which seem to be homogeneous, uh, at a closer look, are less homogeneous. But, in, but they are mainland countries in, South, in maritime Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in the Philippines. Uh, it, there are no homogeneous societies. And if, and there are substantial Muslim communities in these, all these countries. And if they were becoming more inward looking, they had, this had profound implications for the social stability of these countries and the politics of these countries and including ourselves, of course. Um, it was around this time that in Malaysia, uh, Dr. Mahathir challenged PAS, the Islamist party, by asking them, by telling them, you know, why are you asking for Malaysia to become a Muslim state? We are already a Muslim state. Now, that was not, strictly speaking, correct, because if you look at the Malaysian constitution, uh, the role of religion is much more nuanced. But it started a dynamic in which if you are inclined, uh, inclined if you as a Muslim are inclined to moderation, to openness, you are bound to lose. Because now, if he has considered that Malaysia is a Muslim country, then the only, def the only question that remains to be settled is, how Muslim are you? And if you are a Muslim party, you will definitely be able to outbid uh, a secular party, a secular nationalist party, which UMNO used to be. And notice I use the past tense. Around the same time, too, we discovered a terrorist plot in Southeast Asia, Jamaya Ismaimaya. Uh, whose goal was, through the means of terror, to establish a caliphate in Southeast Asia, comprised mainly of the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. Singapore was irrelevant. We were just in between, and it was assumed we would disappear when the caliphate was, was um, established. Now, the connection between what I call the Arabization of Southeast Asia or the Wahhabization of, of Islam in Southeast Asia, and this terror plot is not a direct one. Uh, of course, it's not a direct one. Uh, whether they practice, irrespective of how they practice, they choose to practice their religion, the majority of Muslims in Southeast Asia are not interested in terrorism. It is a religion of peace. They want to live peacefully. Uh, however, it defies the imagination to think that there is no broad or loose correlation between these two phenomena, particularly it, since J.I. was linked to Al-Qaeda. Uh, it's not just Muslims, by the way, that have been influenced by the Middle East. Christianity is also a Middle Eastern religion in its origins. And around the same time, various strains of evangelical Christianity that whose attitudes, whose political and social attitudes were colored by events in the Middle East began to influence Southeast Asia through the modality of mainly American evangelical movements. In any case, then Prime Minister Go Chok Tong decided that we needed to understand more about this phenomenon and the source of this phenomenon and began our engagement of the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Goh led personally several missions to the Middle East, 
Middle Eastern countries to establish deeper relationships. Uh, and that is also the origins of the Middle East Institute because he thought in this such complicated region, it was necessary for the government to have more, uh, an independent source of assessments. And that was why the Middle East Institute was uh, formed in the first place. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that it's only because of this Arabization phenomenon that we got interested in the Middle East. It's not possible to study the Middle East without taking religion into, uh, into, concern, uh, into consideration. But more often than not, more often than not, religion is only a cover for geopolitical interests, geopolitical mm -hmm. dynamics that have actually nothing to do with Singapore or Southeast Asia, but nonetheless influence us. For example, insofar as Saudi Arabia or other Gulf states began to propagate their versions or their ideas of Islam in Southeast Asia and other regions of the world, it was after the Iranian revolution when they saw themselves uh, as, as the champions of the Sunni version of Islam a particular type of the Sunni version of Islam vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, which was claiming a greater authenticity for the Shia religion because they had conducted an Islamic revolution, the first one, they say. And, you know, uh, the number of Shia in Southeast Asia is minuscule. But because of the geopolitical dynamics, the origins of which have got nothing to do with Singapore or Southeast Asia, a certain degree of sectarian tension has been introduced into countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. And I don't think Singapore is free of it either, although it is a very, in very, very mild form in Singapore. Now, and these sectarian tensions in, say, Malaysia or Indonesia have really nothing to do with the religion. They are being used by politicians for political advantage, as they are being used in the Middle East for geopolitical advantage. And it is necessary, I think, for Singaporeans to understand that while religion, which is supposed to be universal, uh, is only in the Middle East, more often than not, a cover, an excuse uh, for geopolitical interests that have nothing to do with our region. It changes your attitude towards things that happen. That's why we need to understand the Middle East a bit more uh, in greater depth. Now, that is the reason why we began to engage the Middle East in the first place. It was essentially a defensive interest to understand better something that was influencing our environment uh, around us and, uh, and to some degree in Singapore too. But as we began to engage the Middle East more deep, deeply, we found that while we were ignoring them, they were not ignoring us. In the Gulf in particular, they were studying Singapore's experience to see what lessons they could take for their own economic development, for their own social cultural development. And of course, we were happy, happy to help them. And in the process, uh, we found that there were positive interests, economic interests mainly, uh, that we could tap into. Uh, we made mistakes because we were so ignorant. We made mistakes as we began to deeply engage the Middle East with this positive agenda of sharing our experience. Uh, I'll give you just one example, which sounds very stupid when I, uh, uh, when I articulate it. One of the Gulf states were very interested in our civil service college and wanted us to help them to, to start a civil service college of their own because they greatly admired the efficiency of the Singapore civil service and wanted to know how we trained our civil service and so on. We were happy to help and they were willing to pay us to you know, give us a contract to help establish the civil service college in, in that Gulf state. What did we do in our infinite wisdom? We sent a very young woman to go and engage that country, uh, which was a totally culturally insensitive thing to do. Now this young woman, who is no longer young because it's quite some time ago, was a very competent person. She was probably the best person 
from a purely technocratic point of view to go and help these people, uh, first of all, conceptualize exactly how they wanted to do the civil service college. But of course, when she met uh, in a patriarchal society, like as this particular Gulf state was, and still is to a large extent, she didn't get very far and you know it was a complete mess. No, that's just one small example of the kinds of mistakes we made as we began to more deeply engage the Middle East. Now, so by the, by the 2000s, we had both a defensive agenda and a positive agenda. Uh, the weight between the defensive and positive agenda is not equal. They vary over time. It started with a very defensive agenda. It became a very positive agenda. The positive agenda is, has kind of plateaued, I think, uh, for now at least, because the, the Middle East and the Gulf in particular have other preoccupations, but it has not disappeared entirely. And now that uh, Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states are looking more insistently than in the past to diversify their economies away from total dependence on just one commodity energy, I think the positive agenda will become more prominent once again. Uh, without, but of course, neglecting the other part of the agenda. Uh, at the heart of this effort to change their economy, which will entail some degree of changing their society, uh, particularly with regard to the role of women and the role of young people in their societies, is Saudi Arabia. The other Gulf states, the UAE, Oman, Kuwait, they were a bit more advanced, but they are essentially quite small countries and what they do will have a limited impact. What Saudi Arabia does, whether it succeeds in its reform efforts or it fails, will have a profound effect on the entire Muslim world. Uh, it's a bit early to say whether they will succeed or fail, but it's something that we should watch very carefully, both for a negative agenda and uh, our, our defensive agenda and our positive agenda. Uh, last September, I and uh, another member of the Middle East Institute went to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I hadn't been there for some years and I was quite pleasantly surprised by what I saw. For example, I saw a number of Saudi women, I wouldn't say it's a huge number, but there, but, uh, a discernible number of Saudi women no longer cover their head. It is now not an obligation. The, the religious police have been cut down to size and it's now up to the individual whether she wants to cover her head or not. Some of them wore colorful abayas. In the past, it's all black. Again, not a huge amount, but in that context, it was very striking to me and I think quite significant. And of course, you know, now entertainment is allowed People can go to the cinema, uh, people can listen to music, P women are allowed to drive. And much more important than women being allowed to drive is I saw in the places I visited in Saudi Arabia, women working. And I don't mean working by serving tea or, or coffee or something like that. I mean, we, we visited, for example, the Diplomatic Institute of the Saudi Arabia, which is a department of the foreign ministry. and there, quite a number of the women, the researchers were women. And these are all very good signs. But, but it's an early stage of the Saudi reform process. And whether they will succeed or not is an open question. Of course, it is in our interest and the interest of actually every country in the world to hope and do what we can to help the Saudis succeed. But in the end, it is up to them. And the challenges are great. In any case, we are now committed to the long-term engagement of the Middle East. And you know, our presence, our footprint in the Middle East has increased exponentially. I began by telling you that we, have only, um, we had only two missions in the Middle East, in Cairo and a consulate in Jeddah. Now we have full embassies in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in Egypt, in Turkey, uh, in Turkey, we have Consul generals in Oman, in Muscat in Oman, in Dubai, in Jeddah. And we have non-resident ambassadors to Kuwait, 
to Jordan, to Israel, and to Iran. Uh, one of our first free trade agreements, by the way, was with Jordan. It's a kind of a practice. It's not that the economic relationship was so great uh, or so deep or so important, but we, when we were beginning to learn how to negotiate free trade agreements, we began learning through with Jordan. And we had uh, a very interesting technical assistance program in conjunction with Japan for Jordan for the entire Middle East. Uh, let me say a few words about, about Israel. Our main interest, Middle East can be divided into two sectors. A kind of northern tier of what used to be called the Levant, which includes Turkey, Iran, um, Iraq, Syria, the North, the, the North African countries, and the southern tier, which is basically the Gulf. Our main interest whether defensive or positive, are with the Gulf. Of course, we have a growing interest in Turkey, mainly economic, but our relationship with Israel in the northern tier is an old one. I don't know how many of you know, it's, it used to be a deep, deadly secret, but it no longer is a deep, deadly secret, that when we, were, uh, we became unexpectedly independent, shall we say, politely, uh, one of the most urgent tasks, because relations with both our neighbors, North and South, were rather fraught in those days, was to establish an armed force, a credible armed force. And we went around the world asking many countries whether they would help us do so. The entire might of the Singapore Armed Forces at that time was two battalions of infantry, one SIR and two SIR. And to our horror, we found that the majority of the soldiers were Malaysians, and back they went to Malaysia. Uh, so we went around the world asking people, we asked the British, we asked the Australians, we asked the Indians, we even asked the Egyptians, among others, will you help us form an armed force? And they all turned us down. Uh, for a very good reason, because nobody thought we would survive. So why antagonize two big countries, Malaysia and Indonesia, to help Singapore when Singapore is not going to be around for much longer? Israel, however, did help us. And that was a very crucial assistance at a very crucial time of our history and the foundation of that relationship. If not for that help, I am not sure we would be, I'll be here talking to you today. Uh, and certainly all you see around us in Singapore probably would not exist. Now the relationship with Israel has grown since then. It's not a purely defense or security rela relationship. It, it uh, encompasses research and development, it encompasses education, a, a number of fields. Uh, I visit Israel quite often, uh, at least once or twice a year, since I retired more often twice a year. And I have often run into groups of Singapore students who are studying in Israel, uh, mainly for NUS, they have some kind of program that allows them to spend an academic year in Israel and they all enjoy themselves. Uh, so it is a broad relationship and it is not one that has ever really proved to be an obstacle to developing our deeper engagement of the Arab countries. Let me tell you a story. Uh, some years ago, when I was still in the foreign ministry, I visited a certain Gulf state which shall remain anonymous for bilateral consultations. Uh, so I went there, I arrived there, and next morning I woke up and opened the English language newspaper and I found that the Israelis had started Operation Kaslet to go into Gaza to stop rocket attacks on Israel. And I said to myself, oh shit, you know, because I'm going to get a earful from my counterpart. So I went to see him and I had a earful for five minutes about Israel. Most of the long meeting we had was him telling me how the real threat was Iran. Now, we don't have to buy that uh, wholesale because we, ha we have a good relationship with Israel, Iran. It's not an easy relationship all the time, but it's one that we, we value and want to de develop. But it just showed you that Israel is no longer a very sensitive issue for most of the Arab world, at least for Arab governments. Palestine is still there as an issue, 
but it is not one that really exercises Arab governments anymore, and many of the Gulf states in particular have developed their own ties with Israel. It used to be very secret, now it is hardly secret anymore. Uh, this gives us more room, actually, to develop a relationship with both Israel and the Arab countries, and that's a good thing. Now, Israel is a very complicated society, which is in, uh, itself in a uh, process of uh, rapid change. There are all kinds of tensions within Israel uh, between the ultra-Orthodox Jews and the more secular Jews, between the Arab Israelis and, and the Jewish Israelis. But I see in my own experience and from what I've read, the Arab Israelis are becoming more integrated into the mainstream of at least the secular part of Israeli society. Uh, if you go to the University of Haifa, Haifa is in the northern, middle northern part of Israel, uh, and it's a traditionally Arab area. If you go to the University of Haifa, you really can't tell a male Arab student from a Jewish student. Females, you can tell because many of them still cover their head, right? But they all speak Hebrew quite fluently to my ears. They all study there together. And, you, and young people, they dress alike, apart from the hijab or the tudor. Right? Uh, and more important, recently, there are more and more East, Arabs from East Jerusalem who are joining Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Because they want to learn Hebrew, they want to get good jobs, they want to be more integrated into Israeli society. Anyway, enough about that. Let me just turn to my last point about why we should be interested in the Middle East. The Middle East is in a state of geopolitical flux. I mean, you could say the Middle East is always in a state of geopolitical flux because it's not the most stable relation, uh, stable region in the world, but it is in a more than usual state of instability and flux. Now, the, how geopolitics plays out in the Middle East will have an indirect impact on how things are regarded in other parts of the world. The US is recalibrating its role in the Middle East. This is sometimes described in the media as the US retreating from the Middle East, I think that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. The, middle, the US made a serious mistake when it got involved in ground wars in the Middle East after 2003. Uh, it is now recalibrating its presence to play its traditional role of an offshore balancer. It is, it is running down its ground presence, and this began under President Obama. It's not something that Trump thought of for himself. Uh, but I see no sign of the U.S. Fifth Fleet leaving Bahrain. I see no sign of the U.S. Air Force leaving Qatar, where it has a very huge base. Uh, at the same time, Russia has dealt itself into the Middle East equation, mainly because of mistakes made by uh, Secretary John Kerry, I think, in the second Obama administration. But Russia's ability to operate in the Middle East is limited, because don't forget, Russia has an economy about the size of South Korea. China is also trying to engage the Middle East more closely, but trying to limit its engagement to economics, largely economics, trade, investment, and so on. Whether it will succeed or not remains to be seen because there's no major power that has been able to avoid getting sucked into the geopolitics of the Middle East. And how this plays out will have an indirect impact on our own region. And let me just give you two examples. You remember, or at least some of you remember who follow these things, that President Obama drew a red line in the sand over Syrian use of chemical weapons in its civil war. But he did nothing to enforce that civil line, that red line. And when he drew a red line and did nothing to enforce it, the credibility of American power was eroded globally, including in our own region. On the other hand, when Mr. Trump drew a red, decided to bomb Syria over its use of chemical weapons while having dinner with Xi Jinping, he did a lot to restore the credibility of American power in our region and globally. 
There are ex other examples I can give you, but I promise that I don't want to speak too long. I uh, will now stop at this point and uh, I would welcome your questions. Let's have a dialogue. I don't want this to just be a monologue. We have got a record audience for this Middle East 101 series. I see there are 175 or so participants, uh, which isn't bad. So please, let's have a dialogue. We have, we have about half an, an hour. hour more. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're not going to use the chat for we this. I'd like you we all to use. Hour, yeah, you have one hour. Yeah. We have an hour. Please raise your hand, and um, I will I will acknowledge you. Uh, if you can introduce yourself and also put your camera on, because Bilahari has would rather see who he's talking to. Right. So if there are questions, you can raise your hand now. Okay. Okay, Junjie. You, you have the floor now. Well, can I have a look at you? Ooh. I see somebody called Bernard To is <laughs> on the screen, but I don't see anybody called Jun Chie. Okay, Jun Chie is coming on now. Oh yeah, okay, okay, I see it's coming on. Hi, what's your question? You have to unmute yourself. Um, hi, okay. Um, so I- Tell me who you are, please. Oh, okay. You're not as famous as you think you are, you know? Okay. Um, I'm Jin Jie, a third year undergraduate studying global affairs in UNUS College. Mm. Um, I think my question is um, how will new Iran-China deal actually affect um, Singapore in terms of how the US will react and how this will erode um, US in terms of the global balance of power? I don't think it will have much effect. As it is right now, there is much less to this China-Iran deal that meets the eye. It may evolve in a different way, I don't know, but right now you ask me, is it a big deal? No, it is not a big deal. And it does, Chinese interests in the Middle East are quite complicated. It has important interest in Israel, it has important interest in Turkey, it has important interest in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states. And they are not naturally compatible interests with those it has in Iran, you know. Right? So far, it has got China has got something of a free ride. You know, they, they, they didn't have to really face the dilemmas of these, or the contradictions of these relationships. Uh, it will. It can't go on like this forever because I see no sign of the geopolitical contest between Israel and the Gulf states on one side and Iran on the other side easing off. Right, uh, and the Chinese calculation of interest is uh, it's not necessarily a straightforward one, you know. It has important interests, let's say, in Israel and Saudi Arabia. Can they be com made compatible with those interests in Iran? What are its interests in Iran? Probably primarily energy and uh, a little bit of Schadenfreude to stick a finger in American eye, right? But it has energy interests in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is not like Iran in a parlous economic state. It is still in a condition to buy stuff from China. So how this is going to work out, I don't know yet. But right now, let's not get too impressed by slogans attached to relationships. I know China, Iran, they call themselves a strategic partnership or something. You know, I, I've lost count of how many strategic partnerships uh, China has around the world. You know, they like to attach that label to everything. Whether it will develop into something truly strategic remains to be seen. But right now, I'll just wait and see. Um, can I then ask a follow-up question? Sure. So, um, for the Sino-Iranian deal, it's actually said that um, Trump's um, sanctions on Iran has actually forced Iran into China's arms. And hence, it made um, the US sanctions actually quite um, useless and how will, will this actually um, affect um, the amount of tools that US can use in the future to actually um, pressure small regional states um, to comply with its terms? Well, I think it is China is certainly a huge backdoor for Iran. Huh? Uh, but, you know, China is not a charitable organization, you know, and Iran is in a terrible economic condition 
uh, because of the sanctions, among other things, right? I mean, their own, they mismanaged their own economy. They have been suffering for drought for, you know, something like 10 years, you know, right now. Uh, but the sanctions certainly did not help, particularly the financial sanctions, right? So I wouldn't say that the sanctions are completely useless, although that China is a backdoor, but it's not a charitable organization, you know, the people in Beijing, huh? they will expect Iran to pay one way or the other <laughs> for whatever they get, right? So I think it's a bit more complicated right now. And don't forget, huh? don't forget, although China and the US are in geopolitical competition, and probably they will not admit it, both of them have a fundamental common interest in the Middle East. And that is stability so that the energy can keep flowing. And that's probably a more important interest to China, which is still very reliant on Middle East energy than to the US, which is no longer reliant on Middle East energy. So when, when Iran, through its proxies, threatened to disrupt the tanker traffic through the Straits of Hormuz, or through its proxies attack the refineries in Saudi Arabia, I do not believe China was terribly overjoyed, you know? <laughs> and this is one of the dilemmas and contradictions of his relationships in the Middle East that he will have to confront sooner or later. I said in my opening remarks that there has been no major power that has been able to confine its engagement of the Middle East to just economics without getting entangled in the geopolitics. It's early days yet for China, but they will, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Lin Ziti. Ziti, you can unmute yourself. Please put your camera on so that Bilhari can meet you. Okay. And introduce yourself, please. I can't hear you. Hello. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. No, uh, right. Hello. Yeah. I'm Zik. Uh, I'm a year two student from uh, year two econ student from Faculty of Arts and Social Science. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not. A, I'm not. I don't really have a large background in politics, but I've noticed that. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, MBS has been trying to pivot Saudi Arabia's economy away from oil and into uh, a different direction, uh, basically to reduce his uh, susceptibility to oil fluctuation and the oil price fluctuations. How do you think MBS will try and steer Saudi Arabia's economy and how effective do you think it will be? And in addition, how will it affect uh, Middle Eastern politics? Uh, thank you. Well, I think uh, I'll just give you a very short and general answer because if you stay tuned to this series of lectures, you will find a, a, a very detailed one of the lectures, at least one or more of the lectures will deal with this in detail. It is a problem not just for Saudi Arabia, but for all the Gulf states. But it is a huge problem for Saudi Arabia because it has a very large population and a very young population. Right? I, uh, Countries like the UAE, Oman, Qatar, they have tried, they have started this process of weaning themselves from uh, dependence on one single commodity quite some time ago. And that entails not just economic changes, but social changes, the role of women, role of youth, and so on right? in, in society. Saudi Arabia is only at the beginning of this process. As I said, we can only hope that they succeed because if they fail, <laughs> the effects not just in the Gulf, but on, in the Muslim community around the world could be quite uh, drastic. For example, they are liberalizing now uh, in many ways, socially as well as, and they're cutting back the, the power of the, of the Imams, right? For example, in Saudi Arabia. But if they could fail, there could be a complete backlash and it could be worse. But we don't know yet, right? But there are great challenges. It's not just oil. In the long term, fossil fuel is, I don't see fossil fuel prices going high again. The long term secular trend, there may be fluctuations, but it's probably down not for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, but at the same time, do they have the kind of skilled manpower? Do they have the, kind, the right kind of educational system to develop that kind of skilled manpower in order to develop other kinds of industries, right? It's a complicated question. The jury is still out, but I, I will, I'll leave it there. There will be a lecture later on the series, so stay tuned. Your questions will be answered by somebody with a detailed knowledge of these things. Okay, we have a question from Alvita Singh. 
Alvita, you have the floor. Could you um, please uh, unmute yourself and also turn on your camera? Good evening. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi, hi. Hi, okay. Good evening, sir. My name is Alvai. I'm currently in New Delhi working as a, as a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute uh, of Professor P.R. Kumaraswamy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this question pertains to the recent strategy uh, which we have seen being made by countries like Turkey, Iran, and, uh, and Malaysia to form some sort of an alliance in the region which also could run parallelly to the OIC. So I would like to have your assessment on that. And well, okay. Yes sir. yes, sir. Well, first of all, let me say the guy in Malaysia who was responsible about this is 95 years old and no longer prime minister. All right? Right. Okay. Uh, he's just started a new political party. Whether he'll go anywhere remains to be seen. I'm not sure that the present prime minister or any future prime minister will take the same attitude towards this. Uh, I think it will be a bit overstating the case because they only had one meeting in Kuala Lumpur, right? Mm. We call it an axis. So whether it will develop or not, I think it's still an open question. Uh, well, you, if you are studying the Middle East, you should know better than me that, that alignments in the Middle East are very fluid. They are in constant state of motion. It is not unusual for Middle East to align themselves simultaneously with two adversaries, right? So I think let's just wait and see what's going to happen. This is, they had one meeting basically. Right, right. All right. 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 And, uh, and the person who initiated this is no longer in power. What is the attitude of the current Malaysian government or the next Malaysian government, I don't know. Nobody right. knows, right? Right. So we'll wait and see. Right. And so can I have a time for the second question? Sure, sure. Yeah. And so there is this, uh, I have been researching on the growing military cooperation between Israel and the, uh, some of the ASEAN countries in the last few years. What, according to you, are the, uh, are the uh, factors that have been, you know, uh, ha that have led to the strengthening of this military cooperation uh, with, with Israel? Uh, Look, uh, I think you are basically talking about Vietnam. Vietnam, Philippines. To a small degree, yeah. Indonesia. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right? Philippines, uh, yeah. Uh, Philippines, a bit, right? Right. Uh, Philippines is actually quite minor. You know? I think you have to look at it in perspective. Under Suharto, Hmm. Uh, Israel and Indonesia had quite a good relationship, security relationship, right? It was right. under the radar. It was fairly right. covert, right? Then reformacy broke out in Indonesia and everything, you know, and the political Islam in Indonesia became a bigger factor. And that relationship is now just being rebuilt. Uh, Singapore always had a, a good right. relationship, as I mentioned. Um, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> Really, uh, it's because attitudes, political attitudes, and geopolitical alignments in the Middle East have fundamentally shifted. Change, yeah. Palestine is no longer a big deal. What happened when Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and recognized the annexation of Golan Heights? Okay. What happened? Nothing very much happened mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the Arab world, and that is right. the significance, right? Right. So, and I think people in, in Southeast Asia have taken no governments at least. A lot of the com Muslim communities are a little bit behind the curve because they, it seems to me anyway, because they place much more emphasis on the Palestinian issue hmm. and have a much more hostile attitude to, uh, towards, towards Israel, Israel, at least right. skeptical attitude towards Israel than most of the Arab governments these days, right? Right. So it's an evolving situation. Uh, the military dimension is only one. In fact, India itself now has a very strong military relation and security relationship with Israel, much more than in the past. Right? right, right. Okay, so things are evolving. We'll see how they go. But I think as far as we are, con as I am concerned, I think these are positive developments. Right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, we have two questions. Uh, one from Simon Tay, and after that from Sukriti Kala. Sukriti is one of our interns. So, Simon, you have the floor. 
I know what you look like, Simon Tay, but please let everybody else gaze on your <laughs> He handsome. has revealed himself. There okay. You go. <laughs> Hi, Simon. How are you? You have to unmute yourself, Simon. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bilhari for including me. Uh, I enjoyed the talk. Um, Bilhari, you're right, the Middle East is profoundly complex, but for idiots like me, and it's supposed to be a 101, what is the moving part you're watching the most right now? Is it the US-China rivalry, or is it the pandemic, or something? No, I, what, I, what I think will be the crucial factor hmm. is the ability of Saudi Arabia to reform itself, hmm. to, to reorientate its economy away from from you know, dependence on just uh, fossil fuel, right? Uh, that to me is a critical factor. That also entails a lot of other factors. You know, for example, role of women, role of youth. You know, many things. You can't you can't change your economy without changing your society. It, it means a, a new way of conceiving uh, Islam. <laughs> uh, there are a whole host of things. That to me, and that from that follows like the opening to Israel, the opening to the West and so on. Now, that is the crucial factor and that is the big X factor. And the relations of Saudi Arabia to the other Middle Eastern states is part of that? Uh, well, it depends what. You know, I mean, if you're talking about Saudi Arabia in the Gulf, I personally think they should stop that silly war in Yemen and stop this silly confrontation of Qatar because it's not working. Qatar, I was there last year too. Yeah. It's yeah. doing very well, all right? <laughs> Exactly. So why bother? I mean, let's focus on what is most important. And they do recognize. Muhammad bin Salman does recognize that the future of the House of Saud depends on the ability to develop certain economic outcomes, which means changing the society. Right? So that's, that's the main thing. Let's focus on that. And even if you are so concerned about Iran, this is the long-term way you compete with Iran. You know? yeah. So that to me is the key factor. Okay, thanks, Bilar. Yeah. Thank you. Sukriti? Hi, I'm an intern at the Middle East Institute. I'm just finishing up my stint and I study in the U.S. So I had a question about what... Go back to the changes... U.S.? No, thank God, okay, no. I'm studying right. National University of Singapore for the semester. Oh. Um, I had a question about what changes would you expect to Middle East policy under a Biden-Harris administration? And how... And I had one more question about... What do you expect the world to do about China's treatment of the Uyghurs? Okay. Uh, I know it's not directly related. Sorry. Let me, let me uh, answer the first one first. Right? First of all, I don't expect there's too much change in substance. Uh, um, Biden may want to take a less harsh approach towards Iran, but he's not going to be an entirely a free agent either, and he would not want to look weak. His attitude towards Israel is not very different from that of Trump. He has a very good record of supporting Israel. And I can go on. A bit of an X factor is how much influence the progressive wing of the Democratic Party will have if there is a Biden presidency, which I do not take for granted huh, yet. I think he has got a, a, a better chance than... I would give him a better chance I, than I would have, let's say, five months ago or three months ago, right? But it's not uh, in his pocket yet, you know. I mean, you, you, are you American citizen? No, I'm a Singaporean. Singaporean, okay. You live in America, right? Yes. Then you know that no American pays any attention to their politics until after Labor Day. Which, and from Labor Day to Election Day is like an eternity. Any damn thing can happen, you know. It, but I don't much, expect yeah. too much change. What I expect in substance, what I expect is change in process. I think a Biden presidency will go back to a more traditional way, a more orderly way of decision making, and a less, um, a less dramatic way of conveying decisions. And that's all to be welcomed, you know. But in substance, I don't see too much change. In fact, he has already made it fairly clear. The rhetoric changed a bit, but for example, on the possibility of uh, annexation of West Bank. What has he said? Nothing. Nothing. Right? Okay. And that's a significant point. His record of support of Israel is very strong. He may want to change Iran and if he can lower the temperature a little bit, uh, all to the good. But can he change direction fundamentally? Re-establish the JCPOA? I doubt it's still going to be so simple. It's not so simple to roll back the uh, sanctions too, you know? 
because it's not entirely an executive uh, decision. Uh, Congress has something to say about that. And then the progressive wing of the, of the Democratic Party, much as they do not like confrontation, uh, is a, has a very strong emphasis on human rights, for example, which are not uh, wonderfully protected in Iran. <laughs> so I don't think much change. Now, the Yugas is another issue. I think China is storing up a lot of trouble for itself. Uh, no, no Muslim majority country has made a great fuss about it so far, right? That's what surprised me. No, it doesn't surprise me because uh, many of these countries are not particularly uh, gentle towards their own political Islamists either. Uh, don't forget that. Huh? I've been traveling a lot, not just in the Middle East, in, the, in Central Asia. And I find that while the governments don't make a big fuss about it, people are quite aware of the issue, particularly in Central Asia, where you know the language is more or less mutually comprehensible and the ethnicities are the same. Right? Uh, don't forget you're probably too young to remember, but the Salman Rushdie affair, and, and particularly the Danish cartoon affair, some years ago, right? Yeah. When some Danish cartoonists, you know, insulted Prophet Muhammad. Actually, there was no Muslim government that wanted to make a big fuss about it. Until a spark was lit from below. And then they had to make a big fuss about it. And I rather think this is a very similar situation. I've told my Chinese friends, quoting Mao Zedong, a single spark can start a prairie fire. Why do you go and store up trouble for yourself? <laughs> right? Uh, but okay, they have taken this path. It may never happen, you know, by the way. Huh? Or it may be happening as we speak. Or it may happen next week. <laughs> or it may never happen. But it is a very volatile situation for China. Uh, in our own region too, you know. I mean, it has surfaced a little bit in Malaysia and Indonesia from time to time. The governments too do not want to make a big fuss about it because everybody wants a stable relationship with China. But if, let us say, a spark is lit, some, some imam with certain amount of credibility in the Muslim world issues a fatwa against this. What will happen? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's definitely something to watch, I think. Yeah. It's a lot of trouble they are sorting out for themselves. Yeah, definitely. I think on, on social media, among the younger generation, it's becoming one of the big things to watch. Look, I've told, I've told my Chinese friends, huh? look, this is not like dealing with Tibet, you know? Now, who supports the Tibetans? Richard Greer and people like that in Hollywood, you know, big deal, right? Very tough on the Tibetans, but big deal, you know? But the Yugas are part of a global Muslim community. There is now, for the first time in Islamic history, a real Umrah on the internet, <laughs> which you mentioned. And however good your great firewall is, you can't keep everything out. People are aware. I know. I've been traveling a lot in Central Asia until this year, damn year when I can't travel anywhere. <laughs> right? uh, and people are aware and they're not happy. And they do put pressure on the... On, okay, I'll give you just one example. Right? Uh, I won't mention the country, right? There was a Central Asian country, a very important one for the Belt and Road Initiative, where the Chinese have something like 50 over contracts. Contracts, huh? not MOUs. These are legally binding contracts for various projects. All but six have been delayed because the government faces a backlash. <laughs> and they know it. <laughs> so it's a very volatile situation. Middle East, maybe it is somewhat less volatile because the Arab Muslims are much more detached from uh, Central Asia, right? But it's not as if they don't know what's happening, you know? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, we have four people lined up to ask questions. First, uh, Mr. Naja Surati, followed by James Lau, followed by M. Marini, and then Professor Rian Tori. So, Mr. Surati, you have the floor now. Could you unmute yourself and turn on your camera? Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, can you see you? Can you see yes, me? Yes, we can see and you, I, yeah. Yeah, good evening. Actually, sir, my name is Idris Surati. Yeah. I use my daughter's uh, uh, PC because mine broke down oh, just... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It broke down just before the, the seminar. Anyway. Yeah, okay. I thought it was rather strange to have somebody called Nadia <laughs> with a beard, you know? <laughs> I'm research, huh? um, I was with the, the Singapore Christ Holdings as, as a head librarian, but um, I just want to... I, I wanted to raise two questions, actually. But one is about the influence of the, the China factor in the Middle East. But since you said that uh, this still... Uh, something very fluid. So we, we just wait uh, for, for for the outcome. I want to focus on the first uh, uh, questions, which I I I want to to ask is about the, the influence of Middle East on on Islam in this region. Um, uh, I think the influence of Middle East and Islam religion has been mediated through the politics of Malaysia and Singapore, uh, the, the social uh, political condition of Malaysia and Singapore, mediated Islam that comes from Middle East uh, that influence uh, our community here. So it's not directly from the Middle East. I was raised at the, uh, in the universities um, uh, in the 1970s where the influence of Abim and the influence of uh, charities like, uh, like uh, uh, Al Rabita and if, uh, if so, are very, very, very prominent in terms of giving money to. So, uh, but the money goes through the, uh, the organization in Malaysia or Indonesia. And it is the development of the socio-economic factors or social uh, political factor in Malaysia or Indonesia that actually shape the type of Islam that is brought to Singapore rather than uh, the Middle East. Some of the, some of the very enlightened discourse of the Middle East that happened in the earlier uh, centuries, uh, people like Abdul Afghani, uh, that continues to have a discourse there, doesn't come to this part of the world. But what comes through this part of the world are the discourse in Malaysia. Therefore, it is very important for us, instead of focusing on what's going on in the Middle East, is to focus what's going on in Malaysia as far as the political Islam is concerned. Uh, uh, what is your comment on that? Well, first of all, I would disagree with you, but you have to ask yourself, why is it this particular thing, whether mediated or not, has much more influence than the more enlightened kind of progressive ideas in the Islamic world, which do exist, of course. Why have they had less influence than these more uh, stricter interpretations, more fundamentalist interpretations. Why? I think, well, one of the reasons is money, <laughs> whether mediated or not, right? Uh, the hard fact is these very enlightened philosophers of Islam have no money <laughs> and no powerful backers, right? Uh, maybe centuries ago they did, but you know, we are talking about here and now. Uh, there is also some, you're right, it is mediated, uh, and money is a big factor, whether given directly, and there's some given directly, you know, you can't deny that. In fact, the institute is, uh, some of the researchers' institute is, are putting together a volume that will be published, I don't know when, you know, academic publishing takes a hell of a long time. Uh, uh, but it will be about the spread of Salafism in Southeast Asia. It's a book they're working on. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, but there is a much more profound reason. I mean, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong, right? No, because I've been thinking about this. Singapore, as you know, do not, does not allow Muslim organizations to take money from outside. Right? And yet you do see, in a very attenuated form, the same kind of influences here. Maybe it's through Malaysia, and I don't doubt it's through Malaysia, through Indonesia too, probably. Because Batam has a rather poisonous radio station. Uh, I forgot the name of it, which you can't really shut off, you know, and you can listen to it. Uh, but I was thinking about it and somebody, a Muslim friend, told me that, uh, and I checked it with other scholars who know much more about these things than I do. He said, look, you know, it's a very straightforward reason. The language of the Quran is Arabic. And of the Abrahamic religions, I think Islam is, um, is unique in the sense that the holy book cannot be translated. If it's translated, of course it's been translated, but if it's translated, it's no longer the holy book. It has to be Arabic. How many Southeast Asians know Arabic? Beyond having memorized some verses and so on. Very few. Some are very good in Arabic, but most don't. Therefore, my friend told me, anything coming from the Middle East has a certain automatic authenticity. And that influences us too, whether mediated or not. Uh, the more the more nuanced interpretations get lost. The straightforward Salafi interpretations, A or B, 
the simpler answers are more attractive. Uh, it's, a phenom it's part of the phenomena of globalization. You can't really cut yourself out for all these influences. You just have to manage it. What has happened in, in, in Malaysia is that the political, I, I quoted Dr. Mahathir some time ago when in my opening remarks, politicians have used it for political reasons, not for religious re reasons, right? Uh, in Indonesia, it's much more contested. The political establishment both uses it and tries to limit it by propagating their, you know, Islam Nusantara and so on. But Malaysia has just flipped one way. And we have to understand, I think, in Singapore, that this has got really nothing to do with us. Because in Malaysia, people are using a particular interpretation of Islam for political purposes, as Dr. Mahathir did when he challenged past, saying we are already an Islamic country. Uh, I don't think it's a very... It has to do ultimately with what is the role of the government, how the government conceives of the role. In Singapore, the government conceives of itself as holding the ring, defending the common space. You know, practice Islam any way you want, you know, but defend the common space. And therefore, we don't have these extremes here, although maybe individuals do do it. You, you know what happens in Malaysia. It is not, it is haram to go and wish your non-Muslim friend Happy Chinese New Year or Merry Christmas. Right? It was not like that. I think you look old enough, you look about my age, you know, so you can remember a different Malaysia. I can certainly. I can remember a different Indonesia. Indonesia, the government is trying to contest it. Right? So the spread is slower, but it is still perceptible. It is always political in the end. It is not the intrinsic attraction of one theology over another theology, one interpretation of Islamic law over another thing. It is how you put it intermediated. I think money plays a part and how People in power use it or resist it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just... Um, Let me say one thing about China, which I forgot to say just now, right? No, I think it is... Right now, China is in a very anomalous situation in the Middle East. The US is no longer dependent on Middle East energy. Of course, its friends and allies are still are, but that's a second order interest now. The US directly itself is no longer dependent on Middle East energy. But China is still largely dependent on Middle East energy, particularly oil and gas. Yet, think about it, the energy routes from the Gulf to China are protected by who? They're protected by the Fifth Fleet and the Seventh Fleet. And that is a totally anomalous and unsustainable position for any major power. So the Chinese will have to get more involved in a military way with patrols and so on in the Middle East. Now, can they do that and not get in, entangled in the geopolitics of the Middle East? Now, that is a good question that I don't have a good answer for. Nobody has. Yeah. So, um, we've got a queue of people, yeah. um, okay. including okay. Lily Ong, who is actually, will speak okay. after Professor Rian Tori. So, if mm. you don't mind, Mr. Surati, I, I'd like to actually go on to the next person, okay. to James Lau. James, you can turn on, okay. You can unmute yourself as well, James. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, you're unmuted. You can ask your question now. Hello. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, sir. Uh, I'm a first year uh, undergrad. I'm studying geography as my major. And my main question would be about the most recent uh, happening in Lebanon, uh, particularly the blast in Beirut. And uh, well, as you can see, uh, after the blast in Beirut, it resulted in a large outpouring of anger and calls for some even, there were even some calls for the French mandate to return to Lebanon due to the uh, overwhelming anger against the government. And uh, President Macron's uh, visit to Lebanon has only intensified this. And as such, uh, I'd like to ask if you foresee any, um, any major political shifts as a result of this, or would it just uh, fizzle out towards the end? In Lebanon, you mean? Yes, uh, and, and perhaps to the general wider Middle East. No, I don't see any great prospect of uh, reform in Lebanon. Lebanon is broken. I find it very difficult to conceive of a situation where it can be put together again. Uh, 
Hezbollah will still be Hezbollah is the de facto power in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Whatever Hezbollah is good at, it is not governance. So I see Lebanon stumbling along in this way for the foreseeable future. Sad, tragic. It is yet another source of instability in the northern tier of the Middle East. Iraq is broken, cannot be put together again. Libya is broken, cannot be put together again. Now Lebanon has, Syria is broken, cannot be put together again. Now Lebanon has joined that unfortunate uh, list of countries, of Humpty Dumpty countries that are broken and cannot be put together again. Uh, if I may follow up with another question. If we make it brief because there are other people. Right, sure. Then in that case, uh, what would you say is the best course of action or the best possible outcome for Lebanon at this point? Or perhaps the, some of the other countries that you mentioned that well, are broken? Look, what Israel is doing is to ensure that there is deterrence against these countries, particularly Syria, that they are not going to be used by Iran without a cost against Israel. And then you insulate yourself the best you can. If I'm talking from uh, Israel, because it's the most stable country in that part of the world, right? Uh, if I was Lebanese, what would I do? I'd leave. Because there's no hope. I see. Thank okay. you very much. Next question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Marini, you have the floor. You can unmute yourself, sir. Okay. Uh, hi, Bilahari. Hi. Can you hear me? Um, for, for the rest, I'm a retiree, recent retiree. I have a question for you, Bilahari, which is, if you were... How come you change your name? <laughs> my family name is Marini. Oh, I see. You know me as Martin. My family yeah. name is Marini. Yeah. Uh, Bilahari, if, if you were appointed as the advisor to President Xi Jinping, yeah. how would you advise him and China on how it may progress or develop or, or change its engagement in the Middle East with the Middle Eastern country, Arab countries as well as with Israel uh, to further its Chinese interests, especially its energy security, the security of its energy supplies, and also to further its one belt, one road. That's my first question. And secondly, uh, assuming China follows your advice, how would this, all this impact on Singapore? Those are my well, two questions. Well, it's very unlikely Xi Jinping takes anybody's advice, as far as I can see, right? <laughs> but if I was to advise him, I would say you work with your, compete with the Americans, but you have a common interest. And that common interest is stability. Because whether you want to advance your Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. or you want to ensure security or any energy supplies or whatever other interest trade and so on you need stability right and there is no intrinsic source of stability within the middle east i don't think russia in itself can ensure stability the regional powers which are israel iran egypt turkey uh, saudi arabia they are the sources of instability actually because of their relationship with their complex relationship with each other. Whatever there has been stability in the Middle East, it has been to some degree imposed from outside. Now, outsiders cannot control the dynamic in the Middle East. Middle East is one of the regions where the tail more often than not wags the dog, <laughs> right? But insofar as there has been st uh, stability, it has been in the result of major powers working together. That is my, would have been, be, would be my advice. Yeah, compete everywhere else if you want. Compete also in the Middle East, but in a peaceful way, right? But you have this overriding common interest, and if they can do that, then it's good for Singapore, it's good for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Professor Rian Tori, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank I can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say my grateful to MEI and of course to Prof. Bilahari. I'm not a professor, please. I'm a pensioner. 
It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I I just I just insist to call you professor because I no, would no, like. I insist not to be called professor. <laughs> you call me professor again, I will refuse to answer your question. Okay, but then, again, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no. sir. I don't want to ask you, but I would like you to comment my prediction. For you, for your information, my field of study is international relations. Yeah. I often say to my students and to my colleagues that what is relation do we uh, study in international relations? I say that we have three C. Three C relation. What's that? C, the first C is conflict. The second C is cooperation. Or the Third is crisis. As you can see in my background, my future background, I don't like conflict, but I like you very have much. You a stormtrooper in your background. <laughs> Stop wars. <laughs> <laughs> but I like operation. So I need your comment, sir. Well, you have. Well, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm you sorry. Have I'm up the three dimensions of international relations. Conflict, cooperation, crisis. Yes, uh, in general. Crisis, so as hopefully to lead to cooperation rather than more conflict. Okay. Right. So I agree with you. Uh, my point is, I have a prediction according yeah. to the coronavirus yeah. that in the near future, the Middle East will more cooperative than conflict. What about what about that? Well, I can only hope you are right, but I don't see it myself. <laughs> okay. I wish you are right. I wish you every uh, hope I mean, I mean. or prediction will be successful, but I don't myself see it. I don't see any end to the conflict in Yemen. I don't see any end to the conflict in the northern tier between Israel and Syria. I don't see any end to the internal crisis in Lebanon. I don't see any end to the confrontation between Iran and the Gulf and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I can only hope that they can be managed so that the conflict doesn't get out of hand. But I hope at the same time that I am utterly wrong and you are right. Thank because you very much. I have a more hopeful, more hopeful vision of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Despite having a stormtrooper in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Lily Ong, you have the floor. If you could turn on your camera, Lily. Yes, it's well. just Thank a you. slow computer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We just can't see you. Yeah, I, I can't see myself either. I'm not sure why. Um, but anyway. Yeah, you enough money, la. buy a new computer. La. <laughs> I would have to be a pensioner to do that. No, I mean, you got lots of money, so buy a new one. <laughs> well, good afternoon, Mr. Bilahari. Uh, my name is Lily Ong, US Media Global Report. Thank you so much for kicking off this critical series. My question to you is if the United States were to seek your advice on three strategic options for their political military posture in the Middle East, what would those options be? Thank you. Well, I would say return, which they are, they, they, don't, they don't need my advice, they're already doing it. Return to your traditional role as an offshore balancer, which they are already doing. Second, abandon the illusion that you can influence internal political dynamics in any of these countries in the Middle East, let alone make them democracies on the Western model. Right? Because it's not possible. Democracy has to emerge organically. And in fact, where there is stability, more stability in the Middle East are in the monarchies, not in the more Republican forms of government. And the third, uh, the third um, piece of advice is the same advice I would have in response to a different question given the Chinese that you have to work together despite all your differences of opinion or all your competition in other regions of the world. You have a common interest with China, with Russia, with almost everybody in stability in the Middle East. And stability in the Middle East can only be assured 
if all the major powers work together and not if they work against each other. These are the three pieces of advice I will give any US administration. One they're already doing, the other two, well, we'll see. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, are there any more questions? You can raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Okay, Asif. Asif, you can ask your question. Can you put your camera on as well? Uh, Hi, Asif. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, my question uh, would be uh, related to whatever has been asked just now uh, and uh, particularly related to why Singapore should care about Middle East. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, the way uh, Singapore played a role in the conflict between the United States and North Korea, uh, would Bilahari suggest uh, that a similar role could be played in the conflicts of Middle East? Because so far I haven't heard of it. Uh, would it be all right to suggest that any of that kind of a role um, a Singapore can play? Thank you. First of all, Asif, Asif, for the benefit of the rest of the audience, is a researcher in the Middle East. Huh? So I think you already know the answer. If you don't, then you should have no business working in the Middle East Institute. But I'll, okay, first of all, let me clarify. We did not play a role in the conflict between the US and North Korea. We provided a relatively neutral location for people, for them to talk to each other. That's all our role was, all right? It was a location that was acceptable to both sides. Now, uh, look at the Middle East conflicts. First of all, they are, they are in different categories. Right. First of all, there are the internal conflicts in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, you know, uh, in, in a number, in, 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 in Iran too, you know that better than me. There are internal tensions. There's no outsider who can play a role in that. Then you have the interstate conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I don't think either side in these conflicts, particularly Saudi Arabia and Iran, is in the mood to want to settle them. Until they are in the mood to want to settle them, there is no way any outsider has any role to play. And even if there was in the mood to settle them, I would be very skeptical whether they really wanted to settle them. Look, I mean, the hard fact of the matter is you should know this better than me. Some degree of tension with some external party suits the regime in Iran, right? It consolidates the Iranian population behind the government, no matter what other concerns they have. Uh, that has been a constant in Iranian history, modern history. I think something similar can be said of almost every other interstate conflict in the Middle East. I don't think people, okay, take a conflict that is, that is, that is uh, not so salient anymore, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? I think if there is a settlement, if a miracle happens, and of course the Middle East, Palestine is the land of miracles, right? If a settlement happens, it will be a disaster to Fatah, it will be a disaster to Hamas, and it will be a disaster to the Israeli right wing. Why? Because they will immediately become politically irrelevant. Their own peoples will demand different things from them. That's why I, I see no solution to the Palestinian conflict and I see no solution to the other interstate conflicts in the Middle East. The internal conflicts, I see no solution. I said, I think Lebanon is broken, can't be fixed. Iraq is broken, can't be fixed. Syria is broken, can't be fixed. Uh, Libya is broken, can't be fixed. You can, they can, we can only sort of mitigate it from the outside, insulate yourself if you are living next to them and then, you know, and get on with your own life. So I see no role for Singapore. Besides, we are a small country, and we may look stupid, but we are not really stupid. We don't really want to get involved in these things which uh, there are no solutions to. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one last question. If anyone would like to ask a question of uh, Bilhari. Oh. Ziti, you want to ask another question? 
Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Again from yeah. Uh, I was wondering, right, if the recent growth, with the can recent speak growth up of, a bit, a bit can soft. you speak up a bit? Sorry. Uh, with the recent growth of uh, African economies such as Nigeria, which are also uh, oil exporting companies, uh, countries, right? Do you think there will be a lessened focus on the Middle East for a uh, major superpower such as China and US, and instead they will focus their attention towards Africa and trying to prevent conflict there? Well, I think uh, major powers are quite capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time. A greater focus on Africa doesn't mean a lesser focus on the uh, Middle East. And if you look what China is doing, it needs, its energy needs are so great, it's going all over the world to look for energy. So I don't see that these are in either or situation. I see you. Thank you. Jin Jie, you have a question? Okay. Yeah, can hear you. Ask yeah, your question. Uh, one quick question. You talk about um, how um, being in a state of conflict actually suits the regime in Iran. So I'm wondering which regime are you talking about? Is it the regime of Hassan Rouhani or is it the regime of Ayatollah? Yeah, it's any regime. So both sides actually both want conflict. No, you're talking about the Iran, right? It doesn't really matter who is the lead, who is in charge. I'm talking about the, the system, the system of an Islamic Republic run by mullahs, right? It's a very complicated internal system in Iran, but they are under immense pressure right now. The economy is in shambles, right? And they do need an external enemy. They have all this. The Iranian people are extremely patriotic. That's my own experience. That is the historical experience, I think, of Iran. They may not like their leaders, but if there's some other external party, they unite. Mm -hmm. um, then one quick follow-up would be... Singapore I think you should, you know, you're Singaporean, right? Yeah. Singaporeans have this bias, you know. We don't like conflict and we think everybody is like us. No, it's not true, you know. There are many people who, or many governments who thrive on conflict. Yeah. And can only uh, survive if there is some degree of conflict. Of course, not too much, huh? but, you know, some degree. Um, one quick follow-up question would be, since Rouhani was actually elected on the basis of reconciliation with the Western powers so as to promote economic growth, will you say that Trump, uh, we should attribute the blame of the current situation in Iran to Trump when he tear up, when he tore up the JCPOA? Well, let me put it this way, right? Rouhani is in power because the Supreme Leader allowed him to be in power. And he will be in power as long as the Supreme Leader thinks it is useful to have a more moderate face for Iran. In a different period, he had Ahmadinejad. In the uh, previous to that, he had another moderate face, Khamenei, right? I don't think the external factor... Look, if let's say, okay, let's say hypothetical, right? Hypothetical. Let's say the JCPOA was a resounding success. And all the sanctions were lifted against, against uh, uh, Iran, right? And the Iranian economy began to take off and so on and so forth, right? Of course, it would be much more difficult for the Supreme Leader to remove Rouhani, right? But if it suited his purpose, he would have anyway. Because that's how the Iranian system works. The Supreme Leader is well-named. He is supreme, <laughs> Because he takes his instruction from who? From God. There's no greater authority, you know. <laughs> Everything else is instrumental. Okay. okay, we have one last question uh, from Sadiq Basha. He actually has just come on board as, a, as an intern with us at the MEI. Sadiq, you can ask your question. Uh, hello. Uh, Mr. Okay. I just have a quick question. So you mentioned the problem that comes with uh, Arabization or rather the... Wahhabization or Salafization. Yeah, or rather terminology. different forms of uh, religious extremism. So do you think there are... I some don't call it extremism. I say there's a different kind of uh, strain of... a different way of interpreting a religion. Okay. Uh, so do you think, right, uh, there are solutions that Singapore can learn from the Middle East since uh, they've been grappling with these issues in the first place. Yeah. 
Well, I don't think they've been grappling with them very well in the first place, all right? And insofar as there are solutions to these things, so-called solutions in inverted commas, they haven't been particularly kind to their political Islamists, you know? They've been rather brutal. <laughs> Uh, so I don't think these are, are things, these are practices we want to uh, adopt. Look, the, gov the structures of governments are fundamentally different. The source of legitimacy, let's say, of Saudi Arabia is their status as the custodian of the two holy places. Singapore is a secular government, so the role is fundamentally different. The role in, of the Singapore government is to protect, create and protect common space between all religions. Right? It's not a question of promoting one kind of interpretation over another interpretation. That should be only the, uh, left to the, the leadership of the religions themselves within the necessary compromises needed by everybody to preserve common space. So I don't see that there's any uh, thing to learn except negative things, what not to do. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Sadiq. Okay, with that, um, we will we'll end the session.